Well, welcome everyone this morning to the latest of our Bloomsbury services um, in our Provoking Faith series. Bloomsbury's way of continuing to gather online and during these changing and uncertain times. Um, we welcome all of those who are joining us via Zoom, the Facebook streaming, or who will be watching this at a later date via the YouTube service later. Um, as a reminder, this service is the latest of our scattered yet gathered communion services. So we do ask, or we do suggest that you have some bread and some wine or grape juice to hand for that section of the service later. Um, the service today, I'm Matthew, I'm leading the service. Um, Martin will be bringing us his, the sermonette as uh, Simon is on holiday. Um, we have, Jess will be bringing our Bible reading and Keith will be um, bringing the prayers of intercession with Solomon helping with the communion serve part of the service with Martin. But let us gather today in and call each other to worship. Welcome to this holy day. We come to offer thanks. We come to sing and pray. Welcome to this time set apart. A time to remember those we love and a time to remember the holy promises of God. Welcome to this shared meal of remembrance and joy. The table where we are fed, the feast we share with many. Welcome and let us worship God. Amen. And let us join together in prayer. Loving God, we gather in changing times again in a way that is becoming more and more normal, yet abnormal. We gather in confidence of your love for each of us as we struggle to see how the world is changing. We gather today on this All Saints Day with memories of those who've left us. We think particularly of Frank and his family as they mourn him this last week. But we remember him for his service to Bloomsbury, his years and years of practical assistance, of doing what he saw needed to be done. And we thank you for it. But Lord, we gather now to hear your word, listen to your promises and repeat the sacrament. But we gather now with the words of you that you taught us. Loving God in heaven. Do I have the words? Prayer, Lord's Prayer. There we go. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And just briefly, some notices, um, well, notice. Obviously, with the announcement last night, um, churches are required to only open for private prayer. Therefore, the intention that we had of gathering for another in-person -per service um, in two weeks time cannot happen. Um, we will continue to watch as these um, situation and the rules change and we will look to gather again when we are able to. But now let us turn to the Bible reading and Jess. Thank you Matthew. Today's 
today's reading is Luke 15, verses 1 to 7, the parable of the scandalous shepherd. Now all of the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Thank you, Jess. And now we come to our sermonette and we turn to Martin, who will bring that to us. Um, please do respond in the chat um, with thoughts, observations or questions that the sermon might pose. Um, we can use these and we will use these within our discussion with the panel that follows. Thank you. Good morning, the scandalous shepherd and the traumatized sheep. As I took my seat, I was aware of my anxiety. I was starting a familiar journey and yet my surroundings felt so different. Face mask was on and hands had been sanitized, but the carriage was eerily empty. A few more people got on at the next station and thankfully no one sat too close. I let out a deep sigh and my glasses steamed up. As I sat there on my first tube journey after lockdown, I realized how lost I felt. As with others, I was adjusting to the new travel norms, plus the last few days had been challenging. My mother had at last been admitted into a care home due to her increased confusion through dementia and we had had the unnerving experience of handing over mum to strangers on the steps of her new residence, not knowing when we would see her again. Yes, I felt lost. And where on earth was God in all this? My brain tends to work in pictures. And as I sat on the underground carriage, the image of a lost sheep came to mind. And of course, the familiar parable that Jesus taught, recorded in Luke and Matthew's Gospels. Images of Sunday school classes grabbed my attention. Collages made out of cotton wool and pipe cleaners and the, pipe, and the point being made that the lost sheep went astray and therefore it was a bad sheep for leaving the herd. But as I began to think about it, was this sheep really bad for becoming lost? Over the past few months, I have found myself continually drawn to this parable and the images of a cute sheep being made out of cotton wool who was bad 
has been replaced with an understanding regarding the depth of a very human experience of feeling lost and disorientated. And that our lostness is not simply about us being bad. Sheep do not simply leave a herd. They are very social beings. And it is usually with good reason that a sheep becomes lost. For example, in March 2013, blizzards hit the UK, which was desperately difficult for some UK farmers as sheep and newborn lambs were left stranded in snowdrifts. Sheep get lost in storms, or they become sick, or get injured on uneven terrain in such a way that the sheep is trapped, unable to get up. As I said earlier, feeling lost and disorientated is a part of the human condition, and experiencing lostness is also a significant dynamic of the faith journey. I don't believe that this is simply a story about the sinner out there, the non-Christian who once and for all has a faith awakening and never feels isolated, alone and lost again. Now I yearn to be back in church and with the organ playing, gosh how I miss that, and singing the hymns that I love, including Amazing Grace. And I apologise now to anyone who will be standing in close proximity when I ne next sing that hymn in church, as I will belt out the words, I once was lost, but now I'm found. However, if I was honest about my faith journey, it doesn't really fit in with a neat before and after story. And the experience of lostness comes in many ways. When we lose our sense of belonging, when we lose our capacity to trust, when we lose our felt experience of God, when we lose the energy to persevere. Sometimes we feel lost when illness descends or when death seems to come too soon for a loved one and our faith is in crisis. Some of us experience loss when relationships are ruptured or when we face redundancy. And yes, we can experience lostness in addictions or when we feel hatred and bitterness. or when we lose confidence in political systems as they no longer uphold values that we cherish. When the table of bread and wine that once nourished us is now bewildering. Now I think it is important to remember that the parable alongside many as other aspects of Jesus' life scandalized many of the listeners and the, and the story of the lost sheep in, gospel, in Luke's gospel is told in response to the Pharisees who were outraged by Jesus' lack of purity. A religious teacher didn't mix with those who were considered unclean, never mind share a meal with them. And in a way, Jesus' use of imagery here would have been familiar with the Pharisees. Aspects of God being likened to a shepherd is rooted in Hebrew scriptures, but what would possibly have scandalized the Pharisees is the recognition, the idea that it's in the lostness, in the unclean, in the mess of life, that God can be found. And that's what's so amazing and indeed scandalous about God's grace. You see, the Pharisees, I think, were probably trying desperately to find God. But for them, it was about a type of religious perfectionism that depended upon their effort to make themselves worthy in God's eyes. Whereas Jesus came along and provided a different path to God that has relationship at its centre. 
he sat with the lost. Indeed, if the parable is to believe, God's love is found in our lostness and vulnerability. The shepherd, aware of the lost sheep, seeks out to find it. For many of us, it's such a familiar aspect of this parable, and yet it's a stunning dynamic. As Pope Francis points out, the only living being who moves in this parable is the shepherd. And in relation to understanding God's grace, that's significant. When I first came to Bloomsbury, it was my first experience of attending a Baptist church regularly. As some of you know, it took a little while for me to feel at home in a new church tradition. But one of the significant parts of my Baptist journey was my first communion service. I remember doing a little piece of research so I knew what to expect, that the bread and the wine would be brought to us in the pew. And yet I was really caught off guard by that simple act. The bread and the wine was brought to me. I didn't have to move. I simply had to receive. Another familiar image of this parable of the shepherd is of the shepherd carrying the sheep on his shoulders back to the herd. Now, I've been doing a little research in regard to shepherding and the psychology of sheep with some of my family as sheep farming has been an aspect of their recent history. I was reliably informed that some sheep, when they are traumatized, they dead and don't move. And indeed, part of the trauma for a sheep would be the level of isolation that they experienced when separated from the, from the herd. I was also reliably informed that in contemporary farming, the sheep would be brought back to the herd on a quad bike rather than being carried on the shepherd's sh uh, shoulders, which um, doesn't quite have the same image in my mind. God is where the lost are. Perhaps God does God's best work when I'm utterly afraid, unable to move, unable to find or be myself, when I have to let him carry me upon his shoulders. All I have to do is to receive from him. Well, perhaps for many of us, our de dependency upon God's grace isn't an easy path. We want to be strong, in control, prove our sense of worth, show others that we can carry on in the toughest of storms. Perhaps for some of us to admit our lostness and let ourselves be carried is one of the biggest challenges of our faith journey. At the conclusion of the parable, Jesus focuses on rejoicing because a lost soul has repented and has been carried back to the fold. Now, over the years, the word repentance has had a strange fascination for me, and there's a whole other sermon to be had there. But I would just say about the root of the word in Greek is metanoia, which means changing of heart and mind. Jesus came to be with those who were lost, and by being with them, with us, hope is given by receiving his love, God's grace. That our hearts and minds are changed as we discover and rediscover and rediscover time and time again that we are of worth, a child of God. Where is God in all this? God looks for us when our lossless is so absolute that we can't even pretend to look for God. 
but even in that bleak place. God finds us. This is amazing grace. And it's ours. Be still for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and heal, to minister his grace. No work too hard for him. In faith receive from him. Be still for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. In faith, receive from him. Amen. Thank you, Martin. And as we take a moment of silence and reflection to, ref to think on what we've just heard, I again encourage people to put their thoughts and reflections in the chat for all to see and discuss. But now if I could ask the panellists to uh, turn on their videos and unmute and join me ready for the discussion. Martin, thank you. I uh, have a page of notes here that I was taking as you were going through where different things struck me. Um, I particularly liked that reflection on whether or not the, the faith journey has that neat before and after moment of being um, lost and found um, without necessarily having the subsequent wondering that would follow. Um, that you described in the multiple different challenges that can come to one's confidence of faith. Um, but I'm going to open this up to the panel and say, does anyone have anything that particularly struck them through the sermon or reflections that stood out to them? Martin, I thought it was really powerful. Thank you so much for your words. Um, and I thought it was really interesting um, in that you spoke of your first communion in a Baptist church um, and how the bread and wine was like brought to you in person during that time and how that mirrored um, the shepherd's um, movement and you kind of the shepherd being the only one not being um, static in, in that parable. Um, I thought it was um, I thought that was a really interesting observation. Um, I am a math geek, and I really like Greek and Latin like derivatives. Um, so I was really interested to know that. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. So you said that the Greek for repentance is metanoia, the changing of hearts and minds. Yeah. Um, was that was that right? Yeah. Did I get that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's really interesting. So I, I studied theology um, for my first degree before I went into nursing and <clears throat> so many sermons. So I, I only became a Christian last year and so many sermons that either Simon or other people like yourself have given um, kind of bringing in um, these, these beautiful, um, you know, Greek or ancient Hebrew words. And they remind me um, of like my, my own faith journey um, and how 
God kind of found me like within all that mess and brokenness um I, like I live with mental health problems so like very literal mess and brokenness um and I think that I think that being reminded at this time of confusion and loss that God is with us is um is incredibly moving and powerful so thank you thank you very much I, th I think it's so easy to kind of like you said to kind of um to have our to have our loss as be that relating to god if that makes sense like i think a lot of time because quite a few of my friends are um are not christians and so i think for a lot of them um you know they they would question where god is but i think um your your sermon that was even more powerful reminding us that actually it it, it is this vulnerable it is this vulnerability and this time of of loss and disorientation where God potentially does do God's best work. So thank you. I also see Dermot and Tim have put a comment in the chat, which I find very, very powerful. The lost sheep doesn't know that the shepherd is coming to look for it. Mm. So we can feel lost and alone. However, God is looking for us, is with us, but we don't necessarily feel it. Keith, did you want to reflect at all? I think right at this moment, we're all um, conscious of going into another lockdown. And the loneliness or lostness that either we or other people will feel. And so the power of the sheep being lost and the shepherd finding the sheep and the parallel of a lot of people feeling lost, both physically, mentally, econ economically, um, and, and needing someone to find them, someone to encourage them. And, and what always I think of is if we talk about the kingdom of God being now, it's now because we as Christians are it. The love of God is works through us. So it's us, it, we're the people who have to um enact that love um so <clears throat> it falls on us now right right this minute to to provide god's love to a lot of people that we know or know about who are going to be lonely in the next month and so that parallel with the shepherd i i i, I could see those sort of the two working together yeah i also see in that that um comment really towards the religious who are the ones who are striving to be the good sheep that never leave the flock and yet the shepherd is going out yes he values them because the flock is valuable but he's going out to seek the missing and martin's um comment that god is to be found looking for the lost was something that struck me as well it's one of the ones i made note of Solomon, I've uh, not told yes. you yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just about uh, thanking uh, Martin for such a powerful message. Um, what stood out for me, I would agree with Martin, is that uh, I think loss is a, a fundamental issue in, in our faith. It's a very, very fundamental for us. And how to process it is not easy. It's way out to process loss and we tend to ask too many questions and why and how, you know, when we go through grief and lost something. And for me, I think uh, as a person of faith, I think as Christians, we, we, can, we can't get any consolation anywhere else than in our faith is to believe that uh, God is out there, you know, there to console us in whatever situation that we might go through. I think that, that, that stood out for me very strongly. Thank you, Solomon. I also see a, a couple of chat items. One, I don't know if Peter can actually read what the tapestry behind <laughs> me is, but that is the footprints poem that Peter refers to. Um, 
I do encourage those that are not familiar with it to uh, go and look it up. It is a very, very powerful allegory of God carrying us when we are at our time of most need. But Nigel, yes, your point with regards ministers is equally true. A minister in a former church remind of mine said that a minister should be a shepherd and not a sheepdog. It is worth remembering that this parable is about a shepherd, not a sheepdog, going to seek and bring back the lost, not going out to harass and round up the stray. And it's a very, it's a very different way of thinking about things, Nigel, but yes, I very much agree. Yeah. Um, I also, Martin, I, I, as a musician, I appreciated your references to various hymns during the sermon. Um, I shall now have some fun probably playing through Be Still and Know that uh, I know just is a tune and a set of words that carry so much power. And like you, I look forward to the opportunity to um, gather and sing together again, because I believe that that will be a time for rejoicing hearts, um, even those of us that are less capable of hitting and holding a note will uh, be going with gusto, I expect. Did anyone have anything they wanted to add in closure? In which case, um, we now move on to the musical contribution that has been pre-recorded and uh, look, for, look forward to hearing another powerful hymn, When I Needed a Neighbour. So now Martin and Solomon will bring us to our communion. Jesus said, Verily I, very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they came and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give you, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world.
We are the people of God. We are the body of Christ. We are scattered and the body of Christ is broken. But as we gather, the body of Christ is remembered. So together, we gather in obedience to Jesus' command. To remember and to share together in breaking bread and drinking wine. In remembrance of the death of Christ. Each piece of bread that we eat was once scattered across the fields. And the grain that God gave to grow has become for us the bread of life. Each sip of wine that we drink was once many vines. And the grapes that God gave to grow have become for us the new wine of God's kingdom. In our communion with one another, we are fed with the bread of heaven that sustain us. And we drink the wine of gladness that brings us joy. The people of Israel were sustained by God through their years of wilderness wandering. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to the habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. God rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. And we too are God's people, sustained by God through the wilderness of this world. Jesus said to his disciples, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. On the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread, said a blessing, broke it, and gave it to them with the words, This is my body. It is for you. Do this to remember me. Later, he took a cup of wine, saying, this cup is God's new confidence. Seal with my blood. Drink from it, all of you, to remember me. So now, following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this wine, the ordinary things of the world, which Christ will make special. And as he said a prayer before sharing, let us do so too. God of all those who are scattered and broken, you call us to wholeness. We thank you for the love demonstrated in giving your son, that we might be united with you. We thank you that in Christ you enter into the pain, uncertainty, and fear of our world. And that your arms are open in loving embrace, gathering us to you as a mother hen gathers her brood under her wing, as a shepherd gathers his flock. 
we thank you for bread and wine, symbols and signs for us today of your faithfulness to your people through all ages. Amen. Yet the word of the Lord, all nations, and declared in the coastlands far away, say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. Let us share in bread together. Then all the Judeans returned from all the places to which they had been scattered and came to the land of Judah, to Galilee as Mizpah, and did gather wine and summer fruits in great abundance. Let us share in wine together. Jesus said, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution. But take courage, I have conquered the world. Solomon, Martin, thank you very much. Um, we now come to our time of intercession. So I ask Keith to bring us the prayers that he has prepared. I will use some words that we've used before to bring our thoughts together. Love never fails. Even in the darkest moments, love gives hope. Love compels us to fight against coronavirus alongside our sisters and brothers living in poverty. Love compels us to stand together in prayer with our neighbours near and far. Love compels us to give and act as one. Now it is clear that our futures are bound together more tightly than ever before. As we pray in our individual homes, around the nation and around the world, we are united as one family. So let us pause and give a find a moment of peace as we lift up our hearts together in prayer. Dear God, as we come before you in prayer, we recognise that, especially at times like this, we all depend on so many people who work to maintain our lives. So we give you thanks for health and care workers who look after us, whether we are young, old, strong or weak. The farmers, importers, factory workers, supermarket workers and delivery drivers who keep supplies of food coming those who bring us news and entertainment, those in government and local authorities who endeavour to manage this crisis, and all those we don't think about, from postmen to plumbers, without whom our lives would not be so comfortable. As we give you thanks and recognise how in all these areas of our lives, your love touches us, we thank you especially for our families and friends who continue to lift us up in these times of uncertainty. That love that we see around us reminds us to pray and to act for those who live in this same world of uncertainty and danger, but lack so much that we take for granted. 
we think especially of those that we know who are unwell or lonely or caring for a loved one or have been bereaved. We think of Fred Mardell's family and Emily Langley's family. Be with them. Help us to pray, help us, we pray, to love them all as you have loved us. We think too of those we do not know, but whose circumstances burn in our hearts. The continuous turmoil in the Middle East, the recent earthquake in Turkey, the refugees suffering at the hands of people traffickers and risking their lives in the English Channel. God, be their healer, comfort and protection. Be their strength, shield and provision. Be their security, safety and close companion. Give us, we pray, the conviction to support the volunteers and agencies working with them. And here at Bloomsbury, help us, we pray, to understand the power of your love. Love compels us to stand together in prayer with our neighbours near and far. Love compels us to give and act as one. These are frightening times, O oh God. We need to hear the words of the Good Shepherd, your own son, now more than ever. Don't be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. So help us, O oh God, in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Keith. We come now to that point in our service where normally the plate and the off would be passed and the offering collected, where we'd normally be listening to Philip playing the organ. We obviously can't do that whilst we are scattered. However, it is still right to say thank you for the donations that are the offerings that are made to the church through the banking system. So let us say thanks for those. Lord, we thank you for the continuing generosity to this church of those that are here, those that are unable to join us, but still remain part of our community. Lord, we ask that you provide guidance to those of us that are responsible for the use of, these, of this money. We pray that we may hold lightly to it and use it in your service and for the furtherance of your kingdom. Amen. And friends, as we come to close our service, let us end with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Do please join us for the um, social gathering on the separate Zoom meeting at uh, quarter past 12. Um, do also send in a photo if you